My name is uh, Rishat Kasaba. I'm the uh, director of Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. Uh, on behalf of the Jackson School and our Japan Studies program, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture. I would like to start this evening by acknowledging uh, several of our distinguished guests. Honorable Consul General of Japan in Seattle, Masahiro Omura, and his staff. We're very pleased that they're with us. I would also like to thank Bob Stacy, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, for being with us. And uh, in particular, I would like to acknowledge the generosity of the Mitsubishi Corporation, and in particular, Mr. Shinichiro Kawazoe, who is the Vice President of Mitsubishi Corporation Americas and General Manager of the Seattle branch and his staff for being here and for supporting this series. Their generosity has been a very important factor in bringing together over this last year a number of very distinguished specialists on Japan's politics, history, and international relations. This has been a very successful series and we've learned a lot from our visitors and we're really grateful for your support for making it possible. And I now have the uh, actually difficult task of introducing Professor Pyle. Uh, I can just say that he's a member of the University of Washington Japan Studies program and also Henry M. Jackson Professor of History and Asian Studies. But of course that's, that wouldn't do justice to an incredibly rich record of scholarship and leadership that Ken has performed at the university. I will only tell you that this is his 50th year of consecutive teaching at the University of Washington. And we've all been... <laughs> I and all of my co colleagues, we've been really privileged to work alongside Ken. And uh, he, uh, and I'm sure uh, a lot of his students are here, and over the years he has trained a whole generation of Japan specialists here and all over the world, and we're grateful to him for, for his continuing service. So I would like to now call Ken on the podium, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Rasat. So we have a special opportunity tonight to hear a very distinguished expert on Japanese history and politics, foreign relations, and especially U.S.-Japan relations. <clears throat> the American diplomat George Kennan uh, once referred to the U.S.-Japan relationship as an unnatural intimacy. Uh, by that, he meant uh, that we are two peoples of very different cultures and history thrown together by events into a remarkably close relationship. Our modern histories have become inextricably intertwined, and we're now coming into a time of increased tension and turmoil in the Asia-Pacific region when our alliance of more than 60 years faces new challenges that will require change. We're fortunate, as I say, to have our speaker this evening, one who is really centrally involved in the rethinking of Japanese foreign policy and security studies. Professor Kitaoka has had a remarkable career of scholarship and policy making. He's been deeply involved in the shaping of Japanese foreign policy since the end, particularly since the end of the Cold War, uh, especially in the last year and a half since the re-election of uh, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo in December of 2012. He has served in several important advisory uh, positions to the Abe government. He was acting chair of the panel on reconstruction of the legal basis of Japanese security policy, which presented its report just two weeks ago uh, to the Prime Minister, recommending a reinterpretation of Article 9 
of the Constitution to permit uh, collective self-defense. This is a highly significant recommendation since it would permit a much closer U.S.-Japan alliance. He's also chair of a committee advising the Prime Minister on formulation of long-range national security strategy. In the past, too, he has also been uh, involved in many challenging policy tasks. Uh, from 2004 to 2006, he was Japanese ambassador to the United Nations at a time when Japan was seeking permanent membership uh, on the UN Security Council. He was also, uh, at a later time, chair of a government commission to look into the archives and make public uh, various secret agreements between Japan and the United States during the Cold War. He was also chair of a Japanese panel of scholars that uh, held a series of meetings with Chinese scholars and that attempted to arrive at a common view of uh, modern East Asian history. So he's been involved in uh, a number of extremely important uh, uh, assignments. He's graduate of the University of Tokyo, where he studied with uh, uh, one of my good friends, uh, Sato Seizaburo, who uh, has uh, now passed away some years ago. Uh, he was also a visiting scholar at, uh, at Princeton for two years. He's served on the faculty at Rikyo University and then uh, to his alma mater at the University of Tokyo. Presently, he is professor of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, and he is president of the International University of Japan. With all of that, he is also a, an extremely active scholar. Uh, he's written numerous books on Japanese politics, <coughs> history, foreign policy, and especially U.S.-Japan relations. Interestingly, his first book, uh, was a biography of the liberal journalist uh, Kiyosawa Kiyoshi, uh, who as a young man spent many years uh, living in Washington State early in the 20th century, and later uh, was editor of a Japanese-American newspaper in Tacoma. And just yesterday, uh, Professor Kitaoka was retracing some of the uh, steps of uh, of uh, Kiyosawa in Tacoma. Professor Kita, uh, Kitaoka's most recent book is a study of the Imperial uh, Japanese Army. So will you please join me in welcoming Professor Kitaoka. Thank you very much, Professor Pai, for a very, very kind introduction. Uh, it's a really a great honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I thank uh, to uh, uh, the sub sponsor, Mitsubishi Corporation, who is represented by Mr. Kawazoe, and then uh, uh, Jackson uh, School, North Japan programs, and uh, more than anyone else, uh, very capable Secretary Ellen sitting here. Um, I like this city and this university very much, because of two reasons. One is very obvious. This is a very nice place with a comfortable sea breeze and then a uh, beautiful city. Uh, we could enjoy a, a little more a relaxed time here uh, than in Tokyo. Um, the second is, as uh, Professor Pyle mentioned, I once wrote a book on a, a Japanese journalist who I consider the best diplomat commentator before wartime uh, by the name of Kiyosawa Kiyoshi, who came from Nagano Prefecture to Seattle uh, in uh, 1907. And he started his career as a journalist for uh, a Japanese language newspaper here. And then uh, 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 the reason why I consider that he was uh, uh, the best diplomatic commentator, uh, he has provided a penetrating insight criticizing Japan's expansionism, uh, particularly during the uh, latter half of 1920s and 1930s. Uh, unlike other 
so-called American specialists in Japan. Uh, they are uh, diplomats or business leaders or university professors who mainly contacted with the Eastern elites. Unlike them, Kiyosa was a, a young boy who came here uh, as an immigrant for labor. So uh, unlike other leaders who could communicate with the uh, Eastern elites, Kiyosa could see the United States from the bottom, from the West. That's one of the reasons why he could provide uh, such a penetrating insights about the U.S.-Japan relations. And yesterday I had a chance to visit his uh, uh, former uh, residence or, or a small apartment in reality uh, where he dropped in when he came here in 1907. And then uh, soon, within a few months, he moved to Tacoma. And then uh, we could find out that the same number of the building on the same number of the streets. So uh, we are very sure that that must have been his uh, a temporary residence. I stop here because that talk would be endless. Uh, and then let me go into the today's topic. Uh, but beforehand, I, I just remembered one more thing. Uh, uh, you may feel that uh, uh, my attempts has been all uh, failure. <laughs> you may consider that uh, uh, Japan could not become a permanent member of the Security Council. The historical reconciliation was not achieved. Uh, and then Japan's uh, security policy is not uh, particularly changing. But the, the third one is I'm, I hope that uh, we can achieve this one uh, very much. This is the today's topic. Uh, and also, I, I have to say that on, even on the first uh, two topics, there were some progresses. Uh, and then I hope uh, those uh, progresses will be continued in the future. Now, the topic is East Asian security challenges and then Japan's new strategy. Uh, the security challenges are quite clear. Uh, uh, first, let me focus on the North Korean situation. It was in 1994 when the North Korean uh, nuclear development was revealed. And it was suspended by the uh, sudden visit of uh, former President Jimmy Carter to Pyongyang. And then uh, 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 Japan, South Korea, United States agreed on uh, providing energy uh, by establishing a Korean uh, Peninsula Energy uh, Development Organization, expecting that North Korea could not continue its nuclear development because it's too much heavy burden economically. But the reality was it was continued. And the effort of Kedo was a total failure, I guess. And then uh, in 2006, when I was in the, uh, working at, in New York, uh, they made a first nuclear test. Some people said it's a failure. Other people said it's a success. But anyhow, second nuclear test was uh, done in 2009. It was a success. And then uh, last year, there was a third nuclear test. So they are certainly gradually or fastly developing nuclear weapons. Their now target is how to make it smaller and lighter so that they can be conveyed by the missiles. On the missile front, the first missile test of uh, so-called Nodong was done in 1993. Now uh, the range is expanded. Now uh, in uh, 2012, they made a missile test that missile uh, arrived at the uh, coast of the Philippines. If it is fully developed, uh, the missile is uh, named as a Tepoton 2, then that could uh, reach to the west coast uh, if it's fully developed. So the, uh, the first missile, uh, 10 years ago, there was no nuclear test. Okay? That means uh, in, in the past 10 years, the security environment from North Korea is uh, deteriorated uh, from the viewpoint of Japan very much. And uh, during that time, there were minor uh, clashes between uh, South Korea, or actually, uh, uh, in reality, the, the provocation from the North, uh, uh, shelling on Yongbyondo, or sinking of a, a Korean vessel, and then 
many uh, minor things have been taking place. We should not ignore, ignore the, uh, the advancement of their military technology, despite of their economic uh, stagnation. And then, but secondly, uh, on China. China is a, a big headache for us. Uh, the uh, military budget, just take a look at the military budget. The, uh, it is said that uh, they are uh, officially uh, publicized the military budget covers only half or 40% uh, of the reality. But anyhow, the, the uh, officially publicized the military budget has been growing by 10% or more than 10% every year. In the past 10 years, it has become quadrupled four times. So it's in the area of military, becoming four times is a very important and serious kind of thing. And then, uh, of course, there was a period when Japan made a, a rapid economic growth from late 1950s to early 1970s uh, for 20 years. During that period, uh, Japan's military budget expanded uh, along with the rise of uh, the budget and the uh, economy as a whole. But the pace of uh, development was uh, smaller. The, the growth, uh, as a result, the percentage of uh, Japan's military budget in uh, uh, a little bit uh, before 1960 was uh, uh, around 1.2% uh, of GDP, but it dropped uh, to 0.8% uh, or something like that. Uh, in, in short, the Japan's military budget did not grow as high as uh, the economic as a whole. That's not the case in China. The military budget is growing about the, at about the same uh, pace or even higher than the uh, budget growth. Uh, this year, their budget is, uh, uh, the military budget is uh, to become uh, the 12.2% growth is uh, predicted, while budget as a whole is, uh, uh, the economy as a whole was uh, uh, 7 point something. So uh, the, the growth of uh, military budget is more, clearly more <coughs> than the growth of economy as a whole. I'm afraid this cannot be sustained. Uh, in some time in the future, there may be a possibility, maybe a timing, that the government has to keep, suppress the growth of military budget uh, to the, at least to the level of uh, uh, the economic growth as a whole. I wonder if they can do that. Or there may be a strong uh, resistance from the military. That's a very important, uh, possibly a moment of truth in the future. But now, uh, but still, the, the growth of military budget is uh, uh, kind of inevitable because the economy as a whole is growing. We are more concerned about the manner in which China is growing, particularly geographically in the sea, on the sea rather than on the land. Let me first touch upon the South China Sea. It was uh, many years ago when China made the first clash with uh, Vietnam, then the South Vietnamese. It was in 1974. They were disputing over the uh, position of uh, parcel islands. The, the map is, uh, that does appear on the uh, second page. Then uh, the, there was a crash, and then China took over the parcel islands. <coughs> and then uh, in 1988, China built an airport there. And then using this airport, China uh, made a clash with the Vietnam, uh, this time integrated Vietnam, in 1988. And then, uh, roughly speaking, uh, 80 uh, Vietnamese died uh, from this clash. So, uh, uh, and after that, they are expanding gradually uh, in a manner like that. For example, the fishing boats are going into the, uh, the uh, the area which is claimed by Indonesia or by the Philippines as the exclusively economic zone, EEZ. And then, of course, uh, there is a protest or resistance from uh, Indonesia or Philippines. But then uh, the Chinese fishing boats are escorted by the government ships 
of China, which are uh, ships uh, remodeled, rebuilt from the warships, about the size of 3,000 tons or 5,000 tons, almost a small warships. It's uh, impossible for uh, Indonesian or uh, Philippines to resist against them. By so doing, uh, the, they are expanding their economic zone and now uh, came to declare that uh, uh, this line, uh, red line, the so-called nine dash line or nine dotted line is an uh, uh, area where China is controlling and where no other countries uh, should not enter. Uh, one of the Chinese leaders once declared that we are demanding only 80% of the South China Sea. But uh, uh, it seems uh, more than 80%. But anyhow, the, the, the problem is that not only those disputed islands are located within this line, parcels and spratteries, but also there are many public sea is included. As you see, the territorial right goes up until 12 nautical miles. Beyond that is a public sea for any country to navigate. But uh, China is uh, saying that this is our area. No other country should enter. And then uh, they have never used uh, 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 warships or the uh, navy, but somewhat similar <laughs> kind of thing. So they are using uh, many uh, measures short of uh, war, short of uh, military, but uh, somewhat similar to military. Recently, Philippines government brought this issue into uh, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea in Hamburg uh, for uh, uh, mediation. And then uh, in the case of uh, mediation, uh, the, uh, uh, China has to uh, respond to this. But China declined to uh, enter into this uh, mediation process. So the, uh, usually the Philippines appoint, are uh, allowed to appoint two judges. China is allowed to appoint two judges. And the Supreme Court, the, the, the International Tribunal Court uh, should appoint some members. But uh, uh, the, Chinese, the, the seats to be appointed by China is uh, uh, vacant. Therefore, it was appointed by the uh, uh, ITROS, International Tribunal of the Sea of the Law. And then the chief judge is uh, uh, Ambassador Yanai, uh, a Japanese, so it's not a very clever choice. But anyhow, they are declining to enter into this uh, process. But um, it's very dangerous. You know, uh, as a scholar, I believe that uh, peaceful solution of the international disputes, the commitment to peaceful a solution of uh, international disputes by diplomacy or by negotiation or by uh, uh, the courts in Hague or in Hamburg. This is a most important commitment uh, of the human beings after two great wars in the 20th century. They are declining to enter into this process. And that they are saying that the, all the disputes should be uh, solved by uh, bilateral negotiation. That means uh, negotiation between China and Vietnam, China and Philippines. In this case, uh, which is stronger? Uh, that's very clear. This is the manner in which uh, the Japan insisted in the 1930s. Japan declined to go into the uh, multilateral uh, negotiation under the League of Nations or in any other process. The Japanese military insisted that the issue should be solved between Japanese and Chinese. Uh, this is uh, uh, not a very good way of solving. The solution of these disputes should be uh, multilateral and then uh, universal, based on the universal law and values. That's what I believe. That is why we cannot be indifferent in the situation in the South. Uh, uh, we, are, we cannot uh, uh, overlook the situation in the conflict. Recently, as you know, that uh, one uh, Vietnamese shipping boat was sunk by the crash with the uh, Chinese government uh, uh, ship. China always says that uh, 
other countries should not intervene into this process, but uh, because the most important principles after the war was at stake. So uh, we cannot uh, be silent about that. And then uh, we really welcomed American uh, position, which was uh, made clear by uh, uh, former uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton about this one. Uh, the, this is an uh, issue which the United States is also committed. The US has a stake here. Uh, freedom of navigation is a universal value. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, allow any country to uh, violate uh, this one. But after the uh, events in South China Sea, uh, the same kind of thing is taking place in Eastern China Sea. Uh, the very well-known issue of uh, Senkaku Islands. Uh, let me first of all make it clear that no Chinese has ever inhabited on Ch Senkaku Islands. Senkaku was, of course, uh, did exist from ancient time. But at that time, uh, no one had any interest in the Senkaku Islands. It was first uh, uh, incorporated into Japanese territory in 1895. After the Japanese government carefully looked around and uh, no country is uh, making any claim. And then it was uh, under Japan's uh, uh, control since then, until Japan was defeated by the United States. And the U.S. took over its control over Senkaku Island. And it was returned to Japan when the Okinawa Island was returned uh, to Japan. But certainly in 1971, China uh, made a claim, began its claim for, uh, for the first time as, a territory, as its territory. And then uh, uh, it was not discussed in the negotiation between Japan and China over normalization of the diplomatic relations. But again, in 1992, suddenly uh, China uh, declared the, the, uh, the law of the territorial sea and then they incorporated Senkaku Islands into their territorial water. And then after many years, in 2008, on the eve of the uh, three Northeastern uh, Asian uh, summit meeting, uh, the first meeting between China, Japan, Korea was held in Kyushu. Uh, then they, they could meet, they had met many times in different occasions. But this was the occasion for the meeting itself. So this was a very important meeting uh, for those three countries. But just a few days before this uh, meeting, there was the first entry of the <coughs> Chinese government ship into the territorial water of Senkaku Island. And then in 2010, uh, Chinese fishing boats uh, just rammed into the Japan's uh, coastal guard ship and then uh, because it was so violent, so the, the captain was arrested. That started the violent demonstration in China. So it was the first uh, dispute, big, big uh, uh, confusion over uh, Senkaku Islands. And then two years later, 2012, there was another dispute. Uh, that, that it was triggered by the so-called uh, nationalization of Senkaku Island Japanese, by the Japanese government. More strictly speaking, the, the, some of the Senkaku Islands, which were possessed by the Japanese citizens, were bought by the Japanese government. Because at that time, a more radically conservative leader, uh, Tokyo governor Ishiwara Shintaro, was planning to buy those islands uh, to establish some lighthouse and other uh, institutions over there. And then uh, that might uh, 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 trigger a strong opposition from China. Uh, the the Noda government, then DPJ government, was afraid of that, and then they purchased uh, those uh, islands uh, for not building anything on it. The actually, uh, the purchase is a uh, the uh, the the shift of the possessive right from the uh, Japanese citizen to the Japanese government. So it has nothing to do with the nationality. It was a Japanese. Uh, a position that later on it was also a Japanese position, but it was uh, criticized by the, or it was used as a good excuse from the Chinese government, and Japan nationalized these islands. So Japan began its offensive to China, and then they uh, again uh, began to sending their ships to uh, Senkaku Islands quite a lot. And then uh, there is a continuation of uh, uh, difficult times 
uh, it's a really uh, strange game. The Senkaku Islands are uh, uh, surrounded by the Japanese uh, boats of uh, coastal gold. And then where Chinese boat come, come and leave. And uh, this is a repetition of this game. Uh, also, there's an issue of uh, uh, ADIZ, air defense uh, zone issue. And also, there is a almost a near miss of uh, Japan Self Defense Force Air Force uh, airplane and Chinese airplane. And that's a very dangerous situation. Even in the Cold War time, there was a secret understanding between Russian uh, Army, uh, sorry, Navy and Air Force and Japanese Self Defense Forces, uh, not to come too close to each other. We should keep some distance to avoid the uh, accidents. But uh, there's no uh, kind of agreement so far. I, I believe that the two governments are trying to establish this kind of uh, uh, agreement. But I do not hear uh, so far uh, any agreement was uh, reached. Uh, anyhow, this is a very dangerous situation. And then uh, the, the manner by which China is expanding, we are very much uh, uh, frustrated and then some people are scared. Um, recently, there was a very important meeting in uh, Shanghai, uh, Conference on International uh, Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, CICA, where uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping declared that Asia should be uh, by Asians, and Asian sec security should be uh, protected by Asians, namely by China. And then uh, peaceful solution of international conflicts, no intervention, uh, equality, so, sorry, some misspells, mis misstabbings. Equality among the sovereign countries, blah, 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 are important uh, principles. But are they now respecting those principles? I don't think so. Uh, so the uh, China is uh, showing their very good friendly face <coughs> to uh, the United States, to Europe, and to other parts of the world. But uh, to the neighboring countries, including Southeast Asia, they are showing a very uh, powerful country, uh, which is willing to control uh, this area. Uh, against this background, uh, Japan is uh, uh, trying to change its security policy. But uh, before starting, I, I'd like to say that uh, this is, uh, uh, as a whole, this is a very modest steps toward a normal peace-loving country. This is, there's no radical change uh, uh, taking place. Uh, so let me start to explain. The first of all, uh, as partially explained by Professor Pyle, uh, and then last year, there was a National Security Council established. It was a very important uh, development in Japan because Japan is a, a country where the sectionalism is really awful. And then the policy making process is so much compartmentalized. That, you know, uh, the Japanese government officials are uh, roughly speaking capable people, but they are loyal to their own organization. They don't care much about the government as a whole. So that it's very difficult for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to proceed, Ministry of Defense, vice versa. And uh, this is a cancer to Japan's uh, decision making. Uh, we can go back to uh, uh, ancient period, but anyhow, in the, pro in the pre-war period, it was very awful. The, uh, if you have a chance to look at uh, Japan's national, uh, basic national policy in the 1930s, it's um, terrible. For example, it includes such elements like uh, preparation against a northern threat. That means uh, the, to prepare against the Soviet-Russian uh, uh, conflict. And also to prepare against the United States on the sea. Also against uh, Britain. Also, we have to solve the Sino-Japanese War, which was started in 1937. And we have to develop Manchukuo. And we have to maintain good relations with all the powers. How come it is possible? So it is deadly impossible. So the, the Japanese policy making tends to be 
the clippings of the demands from each ministry. And uh, they are very bad, very poor at producing very integrated policy uh, in order to overcome this kind of uh, sectionalism, we, uh, I, I was one of the driving forces of establishing this National Security Council. And then uh, now it was established. It started to work uh, this January. And then they are uh, trying to uh, organize, uh, integrate uh, the uh, uh, national foreign and defense policy as a whole. The, uh, also, uh, let me go to next point two. And then also uh, last year in September, Prime Minister Abe established a council on uh, uh, advisory panel on national security and defense capabilities. And I was appointed to be a chair. Uh, we, we are tasked, two, we, we had two tasks. One is uh, to uh, write the uh, national uh, security strategy. And by the same token, as I spoke on uh, the necessity of National Security Council, Japan has never had a very well-written, well-coordinated policy. And then uh, in the past, and after the war, there was one paper uh, which was adopted by the government in 1957 on national defense, uh, basic national defense policy, which is just a half a page, very short one. And then uh, in that sense, uh, this is our national security strategy, the first one in Japanese history. I, I feel very much honored to be a part of uh, the adoption of this. Also, uh, uh, the uh, Abe cabinet adopted uh, the uh, national defense planning guidelines of 2013. This is written on three. Uh, this is also adopted uh, in December last year. That this is a creation also from this uh, Council on uh, National Security and the Defense Capabilities. The, but these uh, national defense planning guidelines are not very new. We have adopted uh, a couple of guidelines in the past every uh, five, seven years. The re in the recent time, the first one was 1995. Uh, according to the change of the international environment, particularly this means the, the essence, essential message of the, uh, the 1995 NDPG was that we need U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, of course, even after the end of Cold War. That was the essential message. You know, the Cold War was over in 1989. But still, the nuclear development was uh, being revealed. Therefore, a strengthening of U.S.-Japan Security Alliance is deadly needed. That's a key message of the uh, guideline of uh, 1995. And uh, how about then uh, the guideline in 2004? This is uh, a few years after 9-11. So this is uh, uh, a document in which we try to uh, cope with a situation where uh, terrorism could take place all over the nation, all over the world. So the counter-terrorism is uh, one of the elements which was incorporated in this uh, national planning, uh, defense planning guideline of uh, uh, 2004. And then last time, two, 2010, uh, it was uh, adopted by DPJ government. Uh, but the main target, or the main change of the, uh, the atmosphere was the uh, rise of China. How to cope with, how to prepare against the uh, rise of China was a key focus in the, uh, the 2010 uh, guidelines. It is continued to the uh, today's guideline of uh, 2013. And then uh, up to uh, before 2010, the main target was, can you believe it, Russia. So uh, uh, Russia was not a particularly uh, peace-loving country. I don't think uh, there's any possibility of <coughs> Russia coming into Hokkaido. Uh, but still, the uh, self-defense forces are located, deployed to make a counter, uh, to counter against uh, Soviet uh, Russian uh, aggression onto Hokkaido. This, this is the evidence how slow uh, the Japanese military policy is to change. The, they are moved by inertia 
rather than to cope with the international environmental changes. So the, uh, finally, in 2010, it was changed. Uh, the focus shifted from the north to southwest, quite naturally. And then, um, in the on, on this uh, uh, point, the I, I'd like to point out that uh, the uh, establishment of National Security Council was also supported by Democratic Party of Japan. And also, uh, defense planning guideline with a focus on Southwest was also supported by uh, Democratic Party of Japan. So in this sense, there is a, a remarkable convergence of the policies among the major parties, despite of the, the conflicts and the confusions in domestic scene, but still they are, when it comes to the basic national policy, national defense and foreign policy, they are coming close to each other. One interesting was a, a new working method. The, actually, I was a chair of this uh, uh, council, but uh, usually, uh, unlike the usual process in which we usually present a recommendation and the government may adopt it uh, totally or partially. This is the normal process. But in this occasion, we, the group of uh, uh, several people, uh, we had uh, four scholars, including myself, four government officials, and one retired general. So altogether eight people discussed, and we proposed some idea, and we discussed with the key ministers together, uh, prime minister and the deputy prime minister and the foreign minister, defense minister, secretary of, chief secretary of the cabinet of Kambodja. And we discussed it, and as a result, uh, we repeated this process a couple of times, and then the uh, defense planning guideline, as well as national security strategy were adopted by the cabinet. This is also a, a repetition of the process uh, under DPJ government. The, I was also part of the discussion during the time of uh, DPJ. Uh, so I know how it worked very well. And the, the process was roughly the, the same. But because of party rivalry, they don't think, uh, they don't like to say that, uh, oh, oh, this is uh, our way, or uh, we, we support your way. And they never say so. But actually, the, the essence is the same. The, um, so there are ma major steps, uh, some steps. And then uh, uh, finally, the, the, uh, the issue I'm uh, tackling with is uh, uh, the reinterpretation of the Article 9. You know, uh, if you read, read accurately, Article 9 reads, as printed on page 4, the Japanese people, whoever renounced war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat of or use of force as means of settling international disputes. Okay. This is what I support fully. This is about the same as UN Charter. This is uh, uh, the regulation. This is a, a decision that we will not use any military force to solve international conflicts. As I said, I think this is a very important development of human beings. But on the other hand, on the second part, in order to accomplish the aim of the pe uh, preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential will never be maintained. No military at all. This is the message in the second paragraph. But this is a very unnatural and uh, strange uh, uh, clause. Uh, uh, this was uh, 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 created, uh, started by uh, Douglas MacArthur, as you know very well. And then, uh, but still uh, it's, it's quite unnatural. Therefore, uh, the cabinet changed its interpretation in 1954 so that despite of the uh, message in the second paragraph, uh, the having a minimum size of defense power is a natural right for any sovereign country. So Japan is allowed to possess and use minimum use of defense power. Uh, this is a new interpretation of the second half of Article 9, which was done in 1954. This is a very big change of interpretation, and I, I support this fully. But in 1972, the, uh, usually this kind of issue is uh, handled by the Cabinet Legislation Bureau. And they made uh, uh, some strange added, something added, 
uh, to this. What is uh, responding to the question, what is minimum? Uh, they said that uh, uh, minimum necessity means uh, individual right of self-defense. This does not include any part of a, a collective right of self-defense. In there's no country other than Japan where the distinction between individual right and the collective right is discussed so heatedly. The, you know, as a matter of fact, you can defend yourself by your power alone because you are a superpower. But in, to, in the today's technology, very few countries uh, can do that. Nowadays, uh, very roughly speaking, US, China, Russia may be able to defend themselves by their own power alone. That means a collective right of self-defense, uh, sorry, individual right of self-defense. But most of the countries cannot defend themselves by their power alone. So they tend to uh, unite, cooperate with other powers around them with a similar ma value or a similar national interest. This is uh, true all, all through the history. The, all the countries uh, try to defend themselves by making allies, uh, creating other countries. Uh, and then uh, this is an important, essential part of a defense strategy. That's why uh, collective right of self-defense, that means uh, uh, I can, if I am attacked, then I can make a counterattack. This is an individual right of self-defense. But if my friend is attacked, then I can regard this as an attack to myself, and I can join the counterattack of my friend to the enemy. This is a collective right of self-defense. And the United UN Charter, Charter 51, decides that every country has an individual and collective right of self-defense, every country. So it's a universal. So, and also, uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty uh, of uh, 1951, as well as the Japan, U.S.-Japan Security Treaty uh, decides clearly that Japan has a right of collective self-defense. But the Cabinet Legislation Bureau has been saying that Japan has it, but Japan should not use it. That's a very strange uh, uh, restriction. And then uh, I, we are, after discussing the, this issue deeply and after comparing other countries' policy, and then we have decided to uh, recommend that the minimum necessity can include uh, exercise of collective right of self-defense. Uh, without this, we cannot defend ourselves. But this is uh, now uh, uh, fiercely criticized by the Japanese uh, uh, liberal media, like Asahi Shimbun, Mani Shimbun, Tokyo Shimbun. On the other hand, uh, Yomiuri Shimbun, Sankei Shimbun, Nikkei Shimbun, Yomiuri, uh, 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 Nikkei, and then uh, Sankei are supporting. So the national opinion is uh, severely divided. But this is not the first time. There was a sharp uh, division of uh, public opinion in the case of uh, uh, Gulf War, and also uh, in the case of uh, introduction of uh, consumption tax. <coughs> and then this is uh, maybe third or fourth. But actually, uh, if we uh, uh, sit down, think calmly what is change, taking place in our surroundings, then uh, uh, making uh, the, the collective right of self-defense uh, possible is very important. This will contribute to uh, deepen and strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance. And also, this will make Japan use as a, uh, as a diff deterrence power, you know, uh, if uh, the, the route to the Persian Gulf is uh, stopped by the Marines, for example, uh, and then uh, we should remove those Marines. Otherwise, uh, this is our lifeline that, that brings oil to us. But uh, the, under today's uh, interpretation of the uh, by the Cabinet Legislation Bureau. We cannot, Japan's self-defense forces cannot engage in this removing activities because, because removing the mines is a, a kind of activity to be hostile against those countries which uh, brought those mines to the sea. And then in other words, the prohibition 
of the exercise of collective defense is uh, expanded and uh, to prohibit it and to confine Japan's activities very much. For example, in the case of uh, peacekeeping operations in Africa, for example, we have uh, uh, deployed some uh, uh, hundred soldiers in South Sudan. Then uh, if uh, there are many uh, militaries from many countries, if our neighbor is attacked, if we are attacked, Japan's self-defense forces attacked, uh, other militaries can come to help us. But if our neighboring uh, military was attacked by some spoilers, we cannot go to help them because it is prohibited. It is interpreted to be prohibited to fight for, not for ourselves. That's a very strange interpretation. So by lifting this ban, uh, we are not uh, uh, saying that we can do anything. Uh, by lifting, by changing this interpretation, the Japanese uh, government can uh, bring many new laws. We have to, they have to change the self-defense force law. They have to change the peacekeeping operation law uh, so that they can engage in a peacekeeping operation that they can cooperate uh, better and then uh, uh, deeper with the United States in the vicinity of Japan. And then uh, in order to do that, we need new laws or revision of laws. And that should be discussed in the parliament. But anyhow, our proposal is a first step to uh, law making. The, uh, as a whole, this is uh, uh, because there is no country which cannot exercise the collective right of self-defense in the world. So this is just a moderate step. And then uh, actually uh, our uh, defense budget has uh, going to be risen only by 2.8% compared to Chinese 12.2%. Some people may consider that uh, uh, the Abe is focusing on security policy alone. So uh, he, uh, he focused on military issues too much. But actually, we are relying on soft power, believing that the core of soft power is a rule of law, international law. And that's why we are trying to cooperate with the uh, Southeast Asian, East, East Asian countries and so forth. Well, uh, I have prepared many more things, but uh, can I speak a few more minutes? Uh, I'm now uh, advising to uh, Prime Minister Abe on uh, uh, security issues. At uh, this time, I have, uh, I'm not in a position to make any advice to uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe on other issues, on foreign relations. Uh, there is uh, some concern in Japan and also uh, in, in the world, particularly in the United States. Uh, Abe's policy might be OK, but Abe is a reactionary guy. He's a revisionist. He's a dangerous. Therefore, this kind of change should not be done under Abe. But this is a grossly exaggerated criticism. Uh, let me clarify my position uh, to make it clear. I'm opposed to the Prime Minister's visit to Yaskuni because of two reasons. One is that uh, there are uh, some of the people who are really, really uh, responsible for the mistakes. I mean, the war are uh, enshrined. And then, if there had been uh, uh, there had been no mistakes on their part, for example, Matsuoka Yosuke, a former diplomat, is also enshrined over there. Unless he did such a mistake as uh, uh, concluding a tripartite uh, alliance with Germany and uh, Italy, Japan may not have entered into the war. And then because of Japan's reckless uh, uh, entrance into the war, many soldiers had to, had to die unnecessarily. So there are those people who are responsible for the starting of the war and who had to die uh, on the field are enshrined in a safe place. I'm opposed to this idea. That's one thing. The second reason is that the uh, uh, this can be used as an excuse of the criticism from China. 
Therefore, I hope that uh, Prime Minister Abe would uh, uh, stop uh, going to uh, Yasukuni. And also, uh, I have some different opinions on his uh, policy on comfort women issue. And also, uh, as a uh, former chairman of the Japanese team in the Japan-China Joint Study of History, we should restart the Joint Study of History uh, to make more progress in the reconciliation on history. But still, uh, I don't think Abe is a real uh, reactionary. <laughs> he is uh, uh, called as a revisionist by American media. Uh, we scholars, uh, in a sense, almost uh, everyone is a revisionist because we are frustrated by the theories presented by our former generation. That's why we are going to study more. And then the point is whether he, Prime Minister Abe is trying to revise the history totally or not, not just minor, uh, partially, I guess, because uh, he is uh, called as a nationalist, reactionary, hawkish, but, and uh, relying on the, the, the right wing's influence. But if he had thought of uh, using nationalist sentiment in Japan, then he could have uh, visited Nashikuni, Yasukuni Shrine on the 15th of August, or uh, some specific day on which he may make an announcement beforehand. In that case, many right-wing and conservative pr people gather, and uh, there will be a very uh, heightened nationalism, which he wanted to avoid. Uh, that's why I believe that he's not a terrible revisionist. He's a partial revisionist. And, uh, um, not particularly uh, uh, responsible. You see, once I, I, I made an interview with uh, uh, some uh, Wall Street Journal, and uh, my uh, uh, remarks are correctly uh, printed. But actually, they added hawkish leader Abe, nationalist leader Abe, without my permission. Of course, they don't need any permission. But hawkish, I then made a criticism. Why do you call him hawkish? She said, oh, hawkish is a good word in, in the United States. But <laughs> it depends, of course. In the context of East Asia, which is more hawkish, Xi Jinping, Putin, Abe? It's very clear that Abe is the least hawkish leader among them. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm uh, trying to defend Abe's foreign policy, just partially. But uh, I am fully supportive to his uh, uh, security policy. And I think it is high time to uh, uh, change our inward looking, uh, self dwarfing uh, uh, policy to a more uh, normal policy, which is still uh, a pretty much peace loving policy. Uh, uh, if all these can be done, still Japan will remain the most peace loving uh, country among the advanced countries. Here I stop. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much for that uh, excellent and very informed uh, discussion of Japanese uh, security policy. We are uh, encouraging people to write uh, questions, and uh, I think we're, we're going to have them pass over to the aisle here. collect those and bring them down here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I might just uh, uh, ask a couple of questions while we're gathering those uh, from the audience. Uh, I wonder uh, if uh, you could explain, uh, Professor Kidelka, uh, um, why the, uh, the reinterpretation of the Constitution uh, is to be done uh, by a particular administration rather than by a formal uh, procedure of constitutional revision. Thank you for a very important question which I, I forgot to mention. <laughs> uh, you know that technically it is very difficult uh, uh, in order to uh, propose the, uh, the 
revision of the Constitution, we have to have, uh, first of all, uh, two-thirds of the majority uh, of uh, both houses, upper house and lower house, which has never realized in the past. No p single party has ever controlled both, pa uh, both houses by two-third majority. Uh, that means uh, uh, not only the, uh, never in the post war period, but of course never since major restoration or never from ancient Jomon period. Um, <laughs> And then uh, also the, because of the uh, declining popularity of LDP, uh, the, the last national election in which LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, got uh, more than 50% of the popular vote was uh, in 1985. So in the past 30 years, no single party has ever had 50% uh, of the votes in any national election, upper house or lower house. So the, our process is, uh, uh, to be started from the uh, two-third majority of both houses and followed by national referendum. Both two processes are very, very difficult. So if it's done, it may take uh, 10 years, I guess. And then the uh, quickly changing situation does not allow this kind of slow pace. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, uh, you didn't uh, quite have time to finish uh, some of the discussion of the history issues and uh, Particularly, uh, could you comment on something that uh, the American, uh, Americans have been particularly concerned about in terms of strengthening uh, alliance relations in uh, East Asia, and that is the differences between uh, Japan and South Korea, uh, particularly with regard to history issues. Could you address how that uh, could be uh, uh, resolved in the near future? The, uh, the <coughs> opinions uh, of the specialists, defense security specialists in South Korea are, frankly speaking, supportive to our, our thing. You know, because we made it very clear that, uh, that our effort is uh, to change the uh, interpretation of the uh, correct word of self-defense is that if uh, one country which is very close to Japan is attacked illegally, and then if that country makes a clear-cut request to us. And then if the situation will have a very strong influence to Japan security if it left unsolved, then Japanese Prime Minister may consider whether we should send some of the Japanese Air Defense Forces to help this country or not. And then, so in the case of South Korea, if South Korea does not make any request uh, for assistance to us, then we will never do anything. Even in the case, if the, uh, there's a possibility that the American vessel, if there's an emergency on the Korean Peninsula, and if the United States is asked to join with the Korean military, and then there's a possibility that American vessel might be attacked by some country, uh, in, that country in that case, <coughs> Japan's Air Defense Forces is not allowed to go to help them. Uh, so this is something we are going to change. Also, in this uh, situation, there's a possibility of Japan's uh, vessel might uh, pass the territorial border of uh, South Korea. I try to make it clear that even in this case, we should get the permission of that country. So there is no possibility, therefore, for Japan's air defense forces to go into the Korean Peninsula or Korean water or whatever in any situation without their permission. So, uh, but still, the, uh, the, our support is very important if they try to defend themselves against North Korea or against China or whatever. And then it should be remembered that uh, there are many bases, military bases in Japan, American bases. And then they are the most, of the impo most important object of the, those bases is that to allow American military to go to go fly to a Korean Peninsula to help South Korea. Therefore, uh, the, uh, some of the Korean people, uh, common people, believe that uh, they can rely on China for their security, which is not the case. Uh, and also they can rely on the United States without Japan, which is not the case, because US needs bases in Japan to help South Korea. Therefore, the most of the security experts are very much supportive to the idea.
they understand this situation. But uh, the public opinion is very uh, strongly anti-Japanese as of now. So now they, they cannot, uh, those are, there are many friends of mine in this area. They can say this clearly uh, out of South Korea. But in Korea, they cannot make a clear statement of this kind. But people are uh, gradually uh, coming to understand the uh, uh, continuation of the conflict with Japan unnecessarily is uh, not uh, uh, for their interest. How to solve the history issue? Yeah, this is another question of a big different issue, difficult issue. And now I believe that uh, high government officials level talk is now underway. Uh, secretly, because I have no information about that. I'd like to refrain from that. But actually, uh, uh, it's, uh, it can be, uh, we should uh, remember, first of all, the, all the claims are over according to 1965 uh, treaty between Japan and Korea. It is clearly written, all the claims are over. Therefore, Japan's position is that uh, there is no individual claim should be not be any individual claim from Korea to Japan. The claim should be, if necessary, directed to the Korean government. That's our understanding in 1965. Still, because of the, the, uh, the situations in which uh, former Confederate women issue were placed, uh, because of our, uh, uh, we felt very sorry about that. Therefore, we established uh, in 1994 a so-called Asian Women's Fund. And then uh, we, we collected money from the private sector, and also we collected money from the public sector, and then we established uh, this Asian Women's Fund, and then with a very uh, sincere uh, letter of apology from the prime minister. Uh, together with this money and the apology letter was sent to the, uh, the victims, and then most of the, almost all the victims in, the south, in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, have accepted. And the issue is solved with those countries. But the, uh, because of some special uh, uh, sentiment in South Korea, uh, most of them declined to uh, receive this one, saying that this is uh, the, uh, not the real government money. That there should be a clear-cut uh, government approach and government money. But the, what's the difference between the government money and the public money? And the public money is a way in which the Germany solved the issue of, uh, uh, with the uh, victims uh, related to, say, for example, Siemens provided money, and the government also provided money. And then if you have a chance to look at the uh, letter from the prime minister, it's a very sincerely written with a... Uh, heartfelt apology. Uh, so I, I think uh, for, for the time being, we have to remodel, re-establish this Asian Women's Fund uh, for a better one. But by the way, the Korean government did not try to make people know about this one. This is relatively hidden to the people. The very few people know this one, unfortunately. And then so far, this should be solved this way. And then the uh, the respect for the 1965 treaty should be kept, and then there should be more expanded, enlarged version of Asian Women's Fund. And also, at the same time, we should make a cooperation to uh, improve the status of women in East Asia uh, in a future-looking manner. Uh, that's uh, our uh, third approach. Also, uh, there should be more uh, scholarly historical study of uh, what ha really happened. So. The combination of those three or four might be a, a process, might be a way uh, to the future. We've got a whole sheaf of questions here that could keep you, might have to delay your flight back to Tokyo. <laughs> uh, Just choose one or two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you envision a uh, collective defense arrangement with Southeast Asian countries? Not directly right now. You know, the, uh, there are a lot of uh, 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 graduation of the cooperation. For, for example, sending some message, we understand South Vietnamese situation, or well, we cannot uh, be indifferent. That may have some impact also. And also, 
uh, in the recent past, the, Japan, the government uh, changed uh, its policy over the export of uh, weapons. And then uh, the uh, export of weapons had been uh, rather strictly prohibited in Japan. But uh, there are uh, countries which need the weapons for their own defense. So uh, uh, we have been proposing that uh, the export of weapons should be allowed to the peace loving countries on the defensive side and uh, hopefully uh, in democracy and uh, committed to human rights. Why not allow the, uh, the, why not make the export of weapons possible for their own defense? And then uh, that is, uh, this is just a, uh, made a change. So we can export uh, some uh, uh, old uh, coastal guard ships to the Philippines or other countries. That may help their uh, security. Also, the, uh, uh, we can make a joint exercise and so forth. But the, the, the by far, the key is the role of the United States. Uh, we may, uh, in, the, in the extreme situation, there is a, I do not deny that Japan may go to a system but uh, it is unthinkable to go before U.S. may go to help. Uh, U.S. position and power is uh, so outstanding in the world. Therefore, uh, uh, the, the before uh, making a formal ar arrangement, there can be many uh, cooperations uh, possible or beforehand. There's a question here about uh, Japan's reaction to President uh, Putin's uh, recent expansionist uh, policies in Eastern Europe. Uh, how, is, uh, how is Japan reacting to that? And particularly, how might that affect any hope for resolving the uh, Northern Islands issue? This is a very difficult question, uh, but I feel that uh, the, uh, uh, the West, including Ukraine and the United States, were a bit uh, careless. You know, uh, Putin is a master of judo. And then uh, <laughs> he is very good at uh, uh, the making a counterattack if they, he is attacked uh, uh, carelessly. And then uh, this is, uh, no, this, uh, some, this is what is called by some scholars as uh, uh, reactive assertiveness. If you make an offensive carelessly, and where Russia is very, very prepared, the same as in China, then uh, they can make use of that uh, careless intervention and they make a, a counterattack. It was evidenced in the case of uh, South Ossetia, uh, Georgia case. And then uh, Georgia prison did uh, too much demand onto Russia and then uh, Russia made a counterattack. And uh, now uh, it is occupied by Russia. Uh, this is what uh, uh, the Eastern uh, Europe, East European specialists have uh, repeatedly said, like uh, late George Kennan. George Kennan was very much uh, cautious and uh, rather reluctant about uh, expansion of NATO into the East, because that may uh, stimulate Russia. As you see that uh, Russia opposed very much to the, uh, the deployment of missile defense on Poland and other countries. But, but well, very frankly speaking, if Russia is not willing to shoot Poland, why are you not worried about uh, missile defense? You are a peace-loving country, you are not willing to shoot Poland, then the missile defense in Poland is nothing to you. But they don't believe it. That's Russia. Therefore, uh, <coughs> There is a, a kind of traditional way of thinking which takes time uh, to change. Uh, therefore, we have to be very careful not to do too much and not to be used, uh, exploited by Russia. And then I, I think that uh, uh, the pro-Western group in Ukraine and also the pro-American group in Georgia were rather careless in making uh, some provocative thing. And then that can be applied to the know that government of DPJ government, the uh, so-called uh, shift of uh, position right to, to government or nationalization was uh, taken advantage of by, as an excuse by China. 
But also, uh, Russian uh, power is not as strong as in the case of Cold War time. And Russia is dependent on energy and then uh, export of energy. And then that's why they are uh, try, trying to uh, rely on each other between China and Russia. But at the same time, if Russia is uh, trying to uh, take care of the uh, not only Crimea, but also Eastern uh, Ukraine, that will be a very heavy burden to Russia. And if the, United, uh, if the West is united uh, to the point of application of uh, financial sanction, uh, and also the, uh, try to uh, stop uh, import from of, uh, gas or oil from Russia, that may have a big uh, damage on Russia. But at the same time, it will also cause some damage on the West. So this is, uh, may become a game of patience. And then in that sense, uh, Japan as a human uh, uh, rights uh, loving country, democratic country, Japan cannot be indifferent about the uh, Russian activities. Uh, but uh, Mr. Abe is trying to make uh, some difference, create some differences. Uh, for example, the foreign minister canceled his trip to uh, Russia. But the cancellation was uh, informed to them beforehand. So the, uh, the communication line is maintained. And then the Putin is uh, now openly uh, criticizing Japan. Oh, Japan has no interest in the return of Northern Islands. And uh, this is another bluff. But still uh, Putin is coming. So this is another game of patience is going on. Uh, uh, the importance, what's important is uh, uh, unity, cooperation among the uh, Western powers, I think. There's a question here about Japanese values and foreign policy. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, uh, Japan really uh, had a foreign policy that did not emphasize uh, human rights or democratic values. In fact, uh, one uh, foreign minister said it was the policy of Japan not to have any policies. Uh, 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 what the question is, uh, not to have any values, that is. Uh, the question is, are universal values now uh, at the center of uh, Japanese foreign policy making? Well, uh, thank you very much for a very good question. That is also uh, something I just skipped. Uh, in the, as a chair of the, uh, the Council on the, uh, National Security and Defense Capabilities, we adopted uh, a national security strategy. The key concept was a more proactive contribution to peace. What it is? What this is? Uh, the uh, Japanese, uh, many of Japanese people have committed to the negative type of uh, pacifism. Uh, we do not have any weapon. That will be a short way to the peace, which is not the case. While we are not making any military build up, but the Chinese military becomes uh, ten times, uh, twenty times, uh, and then. Uh, no military is not a short way to the peace. Uh, Japan security was uh, not protected by Article 9. Japan security was protected by the alliance with the United States. Uh, therefore, uh, Japanese people did not have to worry too much about uh, issues beyond our border. Uh, US was such a giant, still a giant, but uh, because of technological changes, uh, it cannot be uh, omnipotent anymore. Then uh, whether Japan has any foreign policy or not, certainly Japan had a policy. Japan did not go to any neutrality. Japan did not become any uh, sort of, uh, socialist country. But anyhow, uh, roughly speaking, Japan was following the US policy. But uh, Japan insisted that we have to take a policy of uh, economy first, for example. And then rather than uh, forcing our values to the other countries. We, we'd like to uh, uh, talk together, wait patiently. That's the Japanese way, probably. And then uh, uh, the one of the, uh, our leading concepts was uh, a more proactive contribution to peace. That means we have had some active contribution to peace, started by ODA. Japan started our official development aids in the 1950s when Japan is not a member of the OECD yet. The ODA is a aid 
done by, engaged by the OECD members. But Japan started its assistance to South Asia, uh, India, Pakistan, first of all, and then moved to uh, Southeast Asia. This is a one way of, uh, important way of uh, contribution to peace. By giving assistance to Southeast Asian countries, in the 1950s, those countries are poorer than average African countries. But they became much uh, better off. And then the giving the money and then not wasting, the, uh, stimulating their uh, industrial rise, then it will contribute to the stability and the peace in that region. That's uh, another way of contribution to peace. And then in 1992, Japan started to participate in peacekeeping operations. That's another way of uh, uh, contribution to peace. And then since the end of 1990s, though it, not, it might not be very well known, Japan began to propose the human security. Uh, this is the assistance for the uh, poorest people in the world uh, to help their uh, health, education, and so forth. And uh, Japan uh, donated some money to the United Nations. And through this donation, we are helping uh, many uh, poorest peoples in the world. Therefore, our contribution to peace, our defense policy should be along with this line, should be the continuation of this line, or enlarged version of this line. Therefore, I think uh, without making it uh, clear, uh, Japan, uh, there is uh, some uh, Japanese diplomacy uh, did exist. And then we will uh, uh, try to uh, improve this one and strengthen this one. Take, for example, the case of Myanmar. And then uh, the US, UK tried to uh, make sanctions, sanctions, but uh, we preferred to be a more patient approach. And then the thing is that the US has now changed to take a patient policy to Myanmar, which is uh, not successful. Uh, so this is a kind of a, uh, sunshine policy or, or, or North Wind policy. Uh, certainly, Japan had uh, some different policy of its own. But this worked uh, in the combination of the, uh, the, in the cooperation with the United States. This worked very well. So uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, we will strengthen our uh, policy. But also, the US is coming closer to our side. So we will have a better coordination. I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, this person says, uh, do you think Japanese politicians and government officials are capable of communicating clearly Japanese positions on various issues to the rest of the world? Well, it's uh, really, uh, uh, that's my, not my responsibility. <laughs> but I, actually, uh, when the, the foreign ministers or defense minister got together in uh, East Asian uh, countries, then the uh, uh, only minister who cannot speak English is Japanese. It's a pity. They are master of uh, domestic politics. They are not very good at uh, uh, foreign policy. And then uh, is there any similar country in the world? <laughs> US might be somewhat uh, similar to this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do not know many of uh, uh, American leaders who are fluent in any foreign language. <laughs> of course, they are fluent in English. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the, that's a problem. The, um, the competition in, among Japanese politicians was uh, how to get more support from the people, from the voters. This is similar in, in, in any country in the world, but uh, uh, particularly under the rule of the uh, Liberal Democratic Party, which was in power from 1955 to 1993. And uh, with a short, uh, short break, uh, they were in power un up to uh, uh, from 94 to uh, uh, 2009. So the power was monopolized by the LDP politicians. That means there's no uh, real competition with the opposition parties. And then opposition party can say anything without responsibility at all. And then uh, this is not a healthy competition. So I hope that there should be in the long future. Uh, uh, and then I, I think uh, shift of the government is necessary. 
U.S. is uh, just a, a, a desirable case. Uh, if uh, incumbent is re-elected, it's uh, for eight years. So uh, a change after eight years may be appropriate. But in, in the case of Japan, they were in power for 38 years. That's too long. Uh, when uh, one party is uh, managing the politics, then there is a gap growing between politics and society. And that gap should be uh, corrected by the opposition party. That's the usual way of democracy. And then uh, by the development of uh, uh, the democracy with the more than two parties, I think uh, Japan can produce more uh, the competitive and outward looking and with the command of foreign language uh, politicians, I hope. Please join me in thanking you.